Mark. Okay, well, thank you, Randy. So, I guess one of the things that we've been trying to do already in the last three days of this program is to try to work out what we mean by knotted fields, that we all come with certain expectations, and maybe those of you who aren't um, associated directly with our program might be wondering, what is a knotted field? So, I googled it the other day, and it turns out that the top hit is um, the following. Hector para, this is the sound of knotted fields. Yeah, I think so. So, it sounds rather complicated. I'm not going to talk about knotted sound fields. I'm going to talk about knotted fields in light. So, so what I'm going to talk about is, is work that I well, was a very successful um, project collaboration with Miles Paget in the University of Glasgow, who took some of the mathematical theories that um, my student Robert King and I had created to try and uh, think about how we can create light fields in the laboratory that have knots in and um, actually try to implement those in experiments. And this is, uh, this is a sort of review of the whole um, area. Um, that I'm talking about today. So, maybe a bit more serious mathematically, what is a knotted field? For those of you who are um, still not sure after um, the musical demonstration. So, it can be, so, we're thinking of a knotted field as some sort of map from three-dimensional space. So, this is the space that we live in somehow. It may be R3, maybe some other three-manifold. And um, the map goes to some target space that probably has two real degrees of freedom, most simply. So we can think of the complex numbers, real and imaginary, R2, Rp2, relevant for certain liquid crystals, the two-sphere, and so on. But that's just a map. What makes it knotted is some or all pre-images of this map are knotted or linked space curves in R3. That's the idea that we're investigating. Now, of course, this is just mathematics. To be physical, such a map should be a solution of a physical system. And we've got various different examples of, of people, well, physical examples people are interested in, such as uh, where psi is some minimizer of some energy functional that happens to be knotted stably, or that psi is a solution to some linear or nonlinear PDE. So it's like a wave function. Now, that's not all. Some things are knotted flows, vector fields like the velocity field in a fluid uh, with knotted or linked integral curves. So this is the idea of knotted fields. And if, if you're not directly involved with the program but you're interested, these are the sorts of things you'll be, that we'll be talking about over the next few weeks. Now, what am I going to talk about? I'm not talking about all of this. I'm going to pick a particular physical example which mathematically corresponds to, I'm interested, where the target space is C, the complex numbers. The pre-images are the pre-images of zero because I'm interested in nodes. And I'm not going to th be thinking of any fancy materials. This is just light traveling in empty space. So I'm looking at solutions of linear PDEs, some version of Maxwell's equations. So that's the idea, at least, of a knotted field and how what, what I'm talking about fits in. So the main idea is that we represent light waves by complex scalar fields. So this isn't, of course, a full Maxwell theory where I've got an E field and a B field. I'm thinking of something that's more related to the sort of light that people manipulate in optical experiments. So I'm thinking of, say, a polarized component of light which um, has a very definite frequency like this. So these are the sort of light fields. And I can represent each point in that this beam coming out of the end of this laser by um, a complex number. And what I'm interested in are the com where the places in space where those complex numbers are zero. And in two dimensions, their points... So I'll switch off my audio now. Are points in two dimensions, such as this. So this is the phase, the complex phase of the light pattern. I should maybe try a demonstration. So here is just light scattering from the 
what looks like smooth surface of my cup, but actually is rough on a microscopic scale. So if, we, if I can get my experiment right, um, it worked before. You can see, I'm not doing it, you can maybe try it yourselves because I can't get it to work right now. Yeah, I'm trying to reflect it from the surface here. Yeah, on the on the wall over there. But you can maybe you can see that there's some there's well, I'll show you some pictures later on, so I don't have to do the experiment myself. Um, but the, you see a very rough pattern that it, optical engineers call speckle patterns. It looks very speckly. You see this often when you look at, say, lasers, even for the checkout um, in a supermarket. You see this sort of bright line, but then there's a sort of rough pattern. That comes because the light is, is not properly focused because of the roughness. So there's always this underlying disorder. And if you look not at the intensity pattern, but the phase pattern, that is the argument of the complex number, you see all of this interesting topological structure where the, thing, the features that jump out at you at these points where the intensity is zero, the complex number is zero, so the phase is undefined. And this is topological because I can go from naught to 2 pi in a positive sense, from red to yellow, or from ye yellow to red in a right-handed sense. So there is an integer associated with each of these dots. So these are points in two dimensions, but of course the light beam is coming out of the laser and, these, and so I've got a full three dimensional pattern where these things are all moving around in a continuous way so rather than being points in the plane they trace out space curves and what I'm interested in is the structure of these space curves so in a sense these are zero lines in complex scalar field so they're sort of like the most general idea of what an interference fringe is a fringe of just regular scalar, scalar waves, um, zero line in three-dimensional space. And I'm just going to think about linear superposition. What is possible in linear superposition geometrically with these sort of curves? What sort of topolo topological arrangements are possible? Can they be loops? If I can have loops, which I can, can they be linked together? And can they be knotted? So this is a sort of scheme of what we think that knotted fields is about that um, William Irvine and I are sort of have used in, we're now using in each of our talks. These are the different sorts of areas of knotted fields. What we're thinking of in this talk is filaments. I'm not looking at the entire field. I'm looking at zero lines in the field. So it's light rather than matter. It's linear rather than nonlinear. And because it's linear, I'm only going to look at a single frequency component, so there's no dynamics. These are just static. They're fixed in space. But what I am going to be contrasting between is the idea of the difference between what happens spontaneously, say when light just propagates through a rough surface, so looking at the typical topological structure of light, versus what we can do if we start applying some knot theory and try to engineer topology into these beams. So I'll start by giving a little bit of a background on these nodes, also called phase singularities or vortices, in linear wave fields. Then I'll talk about the sort of tangles of these lines that happen in these random wave superpositions. And then I'll um, talk about how we can engineer knots and links in laser beams. So this stuff is the spontaneous or the natural knotting we're interested in, and this stuff is the engineered. But I'll start just by giving you a little bit of historical background into the sorts of um, physics that these things have come up with. So a lot of people say that plane waves aren't really so interesting, or linear fields aren't so interesting. You've seen a plane wave, you've seen all fields. And in a sense, geometrically, what I'm trying to convince you is that's not the case. See, a plane wave, that's what it looks like. I've got a direction where the phase is changing and the intensity is fixed. The modulus is the same everywhere. Now if I add two plane waves together, I don't have quite this pattern. I've got a pattern that looks like this. This is like young slits. This is like an interferometer. I have intensity going to zero and increasing and zero, and then the phase is discontinuous by pi across these zero lines, but otherwise it looks more or less like um, a plane wave in between. 
but that was two plane waves. If I add three plane waves, I get these zero points. So the topology has changed. And if I add four or more, in two dimensions, I'll just get zero points in more and more complicated possible configurations. So these are the vortices. Vortices because you can see a circulation in the phase gradient, the velocity of the field, but they're also nodes of the intensity. But I'm really interested in three dimensions. So rather than thinking about the two-dimensional case, I'm looking about super plane wave superpositions in three dimensions. And just as three plane waves is enough to see the general case in 2D, four plane waves is enough to see the general case in three dimensions. So here's going to be a movie to show you the sorts of things you can get with superpositions just of four plane waves of the nodal structures. So I've got three plane waves whose amplitudes are set at unity, just propagating in some uh, linearly independent set of three directions, and then I'm just adding a fourth plane wave that's not, um, that's again, random direction, but I'm going to vary the amplitude. Currently the amplitude is at zero, so I'm seeing what we saw in two dimensions, I'm just seeing an array of zero lines. But as the amplitude of the fourth plane wave increases, I'm going to see these lines move around and reconnect, just like vortices in lots of other physical situations. And when the amplitude of the fourth plane wave is three or more, then there's no destructive interference. So I don't have any zeros. So we'll see what happens. So as they increase, they bend around. And at one, they've reconnected. Rather than being infinite lines, they're closed loops. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and vanish away at three. So I've already answered my first question. Four plane waves travelling in general directions are enough to see closed zero loops. It's an interesting question. I have no way of trying to approach an answer how many plane waves it takes to make a link or a knot. I'd be very interested in if anybody has any ideas on how we might approach it. We maybe there are some ways of thinking about it, but what I'm going to be talking about is going to be a different approach than just adding together discrete plane waves. So, more generally, we're thinking about these topology um, of these sorts of vortices, what I'm calling vortices or nodes, and it's interesting just to sort of step back and think about some of the places that they come a, we come across them in our everyday lives. I mean, I'm using the centre of the colour wheel so our eyes somehow join together the high end of the spectrum and the low end of the spectrum when we're thinking about colour. So what's going on? I mean, is there some more fundamental description of why, we're, why the colour wheel at the centre doesn't have a colour? And one approach to that is to think, well, our eyes are sensitive to R, G and B. So somehow, when we see a colour, we're seeing it as a point in three-dimensional R, G, B colour space. And what we're doing when we look at the colour wheel is actually looking right down the 1, 1, 1 direction of RGB colour space. There's red, there's green, there's blue, and then there's here's yellow, cyan and magenta. If I was going to try to make colours using ink adding to zero rather than red, green and blue adding to black. But straight down this direction, I don't have any particular um, point on this, around this um, set of cylindrical coordinates. So the thing that goes with the singularity of the hue is the saturation. If I'm looking at real colours, saturation goes to zero when the hue is undefined. Now, another thing that, well, where people have come about it, and in a sense, Phileas Fogg in Jules Verne's um, Around the World in 80 Days discovered that when you go around the phase singularity at the North and South Poles, you acquire a topological charge, which is an extra day. You either, and it was fortunate he chose to go around that way rather than that way, other he would have lost the bed. So we've got a singularity of the time zones at the North Pole. And it's interesting to think about, well, if this is a singularity, what's the zero that corresponds to it? So, of course, what we mean when we say what is noon, we measure noon locally in an experiment by what is the maximum height of the sun. And if you go to the poles, you can't tell. The maximum height of the sun is the same as the minimum height of the sun. So we're not. So these. This is a sense of what the topology is. The the intensity of the wave in this case is the difference between the maximum and minimum elevation of the sun. 
So, historically, as far as I know, the first phase singularities to arrive, arise in, in science were when people were trying to understand um, the tides in the ocean. So the tides in the ocean, are rep you can represent, by, again, by a complex scalar wave. It's complex rather than real because the rotation of the Earth breaks time reversal symmetry. So things don't just go up and down, they move. And as you might know, that the tides down the coast of the ocean, they, 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 move, they move along sort of the sort of high tide. At, um, Los Angeles is, is a little bit before, a little bit after the tide in Santa Barbara. So if I follow into the ocean, I've got lines of high tide. And, well, Newton and Laplace wrote down exact solutions of the tidal wave equation. We're making a couple of assumptions. They assumed that the oceans were uniformly deep all around the world. And so then it's easy to see what the solutions are. I've just got a, a set of geodesic lines sweeping around these oceans. But, of course, in real life, the real-life boundary conditions are a lot more complicated in a way that couldn't be solved analytically. Well, even now can't be solved analytically. So it was a so, but it was so. So people were still trying to understand what these tides were doing, and it was Thomas Young, the person who first really established interference of of, of light waves, who was interested in this problem. And he called these lines of effectively constant phase the lines where of simultaneous high tide, cotidal lines. And one of his, well, former students later became a very famous scientist in his own right, William Hewell who actually went to my own high school in um, Lancaster in England, who, um, who wanted to, he thought the best way of trying to establish what this pattern is, rather than doing a calculation, is by doing the experiments. And so he organized a major international collaboration of people who would have to, at 1836, all agree to synchronize their watches in the same way in order to be able to work out what the pattern of tides in the ocean was. So this is the east coast of Great Britain. Here's the Netherlands, Denmark, and Norway. And these are, this is taken from Huell's own map of the cotidal line. So this is the high tide at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and so on. And here in the English Channel, there's this very interesting phenomenon where they all seem to be rotating around a point. And this is what Huell said when he observed this. The cotidal lines, the lines of constant phase, may be supposed to revolve around a point where there is no tide. For at a point where all the cotidal lines meet, it is high water at all hours. That is, the tide vanishes. So again, this combination of a node going with the topological singularity of where the phase is. That's just two-dimensional. As I say, I'm interested in three dimensions. And another hero for me, he, again, he was born in Bristol, where I, where I, um, I live, is this guy, Paul Dirac who was interested, well, we've all heard of Dirac monopoles, but underlying Dirac monopoles, again, is this idea of phase singularity lines. So Dirac argued that a complex scalar wave function has phase singularity lines in 3D. It's just a complex scalar function, so we expect to have these lines. But from the Schrodinger equation, the gradient of the phase corresponds to the vector potential with some, with some constants. But if it's possible, due to quantum non-locality, as we'd see now, that this string actually ends, normally it's not allowed to end from, various, from continuity, then the 2 pi that I'd acquire if I went round this loop here would correspond by Stokes' theorem to the flux through this surface of the curl of A, that is to say B. So this was Dirac's magnetic monopole, and the quantization, the topological quantization of the phase going around the singularity corresponds to the charge quantization, the product of electric and magnetic charge is an integer in units of h bar c over 2. Now around the same time, people were interested in thinking about these vortices in optics. And Hans Volter in 1949 discovered these optical vortices when thinking about total internal reflection of a finite width beam. You see, we're always familiar with specular reflection. That's why I was having such difficulty with my coffee cup a bit earlier, that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection of a light beam. But that's not exactly true if I've got a slight range of 
wave vectors in my beam because each wave vector on reflection picks up a slightly different reflection coefficient which leads to in total internal reflection a slight translation of the reflected beam and there's been a lot of discussion about how we, you should think of it physically and Volta proposed just think of it in terms of interference and his model was think of the interference of two plane waves reflecting so this shift is called the goose henshin effect, the goose henshin shift. Two plane waves in, two plane waves out. But the, the interference pattern out is slightly displaced from the interference pattern in. So this is my, re my replotting of Volta's original figure. This is the, this, he's thinking of a zero line, the, z the, the zero fringe of these two plane waves going in. And then the zero fringe of the two plane waves going out is shifted. And this is the entire interference pattern around, um, around these waves. And in this region, I've got four wave superposition, two waves in and two waves out. And, well, if I zoom in here, I see that there's one of these little vortices which is determining the flow of the energy, these white lines of the energy parallel to the phase gradient um, that that sort of assists in the sort of the energy from going from here to here with this slight spatial shift. So this was the these were the first time I think that these vortices appeared in an optics problem. And well, about 30 years later, two colleagues of mine in Bristol, Nye and Berry, thought rediscovered these um, rediscovered these effects. And Nye was a crystallographer. You may have come across Nye's book, Physical Processes of Crystals. And he, they, they looked at some particular solutions of the wave equation, x plus iy e to the iky, or x plus iy e to the ikz, and looked at where the surfaces of constant phase are when they get organized by the fact that I have a phase singularity along the z-axis. And if the direction of the wave is perpendicular to the zero, they configure themselves in this pattern, which looks a little bit like an edge dislocation in a crystal. Whereas if the wave is propagating in the z direction, so these surfaces of constant phase want to lie up perpendicular to the direction of the vortex, it ends up looking like a screw dislocation in the crystal. So they propose the name wave dislocations for these objects we now call optical vortices. And in fact, the, the way that this, these k vectors line up around the vortex is actually related to the helicity of the quantized vortex, which is the quantized counterpart of helicity in um, fluid flow. And it turns out it can has um, so, certain nice regularized properties. So what, one of the reasons why these things are interesting now is because people can easily manipulate them in optical experiments. And the way that people manipulate them is by using holograms as a way of manipulating the intensity and phase of a laser beam as it propagates through some sort of liquid crystal display. So this data projector here is effectively manipulating the color and intensity of the light as it passes through some liquid crystal display. What people do with light, with, with, with these more sophisticated experiments, is rather than changing the color, it changes the phase. So you can imprint a certain intensity and phase as an initial condition. So here's a Gaussian profile in X and Y. The propagation is in the Z direction. But then it goes through some hologram, which is, say, got X plus IY pattern. And here's the, the phase change. And then as the beam propagates, it's called a donut mode. I guess because of an American-style donut rather than our European-style donuts that don't have a hole in the middle. And so as the beam propagates, it's got an optical vortex along the z-axis. So the mathematical form looks like this. So the wave fronts of these beams are helicoids. And as they propagate, they carry this topology. And one of the things that people are interested in engineering is can you use this topology, this topological number, as a way of digitizing information for communication? So if I send, instead of sending some flashing lights, I send some beams like this with different numbers of winding, I can use it to transmit data. So the new scientist covered this, twisted light, it's fast, furious, and perfect for talking to aliens. 
there was a suggestion that maybe aliens are trying to communicate with us if we were only able to measure the phase structure of the light coming to us from astro astronomy. And more recently, um, a couple of people did a public demonstration of this using, this is a helicoidal um, antenna for microwaves that was on one of these light hoses and they sent a signal across the Grand Canal. And of course, I, as I wasn't there, but I, as I understand it, many people were gathered. They said, oh, this is a great, the great sort of physics demonstration. Come and watch us. So everybody gathered there, and they sent this signal across from one to the other. And then someone said, yeah, we got the signal. Of course, you couldn't, they couldn't actually see the topology. But this, but this idea is beginning to catch on. Now, some a little bit more details because I'm going to use it later. The light beams that people are actually interested with these vortices in them, well, they're all, I'm almost always going to be interested in this paraxial wave equation, which is a 2 plus 1 Schrodinger equation. It's an approximation for Maxwell's equations appropriate for laser beams traveling in a well-defined direction. And a natural set of vortex-carrying modes for this equation are called Lagur-Gauss modes. Uh, in a quantum mechanical language, what these things are is they're two-dimensional harmonic oscillator eigenfunctions, which are eigenfunctions of angular momentum, just freely propagating. But it turns out that's exactly what these um, holograms generate. So there's um, e to the i l phi here. So l is my topological number of two pi's I wind round, and l is a Lagur polynomial. So l g. 1, 0 has got a single vortex on the axis, and this Lagur polynomial is just 1. So it's just the donut mode I showed you before. And as it propagates, well, the phase swirls around, but the zero line stays on the axis. Yeah, sorry, it's is cylindrical coordinates, yeah. And here, in this case, LG2, 1, I've got a 4 pi phase change around the axis. Um, due to this 2, and then 1 means that this is the first Lagur polynomial, so I have 1, 0. And the reason I've shown you this is because although these are the pure modes, when we're actually thinking in terms of comparing things with the experiment, we can't have things that are unstable to perturbation. And having a 4 pi phase change around here, or having a line of 0 in 2D, which would be a sheet of 0 in 3D, aren't going to be stable to perturbation. I add something small plane wave to it, the two, the, the strength two vortex on the axis breaks up into two, the two red filaments, and this zero sheet breaks into these four green filaments. And so all I have is this filamentary structure in 3D as the beam propagates. So that's a little bit of the background to these optical vortices. Now I'll talk about what happens naturally in the demonstration that I couldn't show you, which is why I got these experimentalists involved, because they were uh, capable of actually looking at it properly. So if, you've, if I'd been able to do the demonstration, you would have seen some blobby pattern, a speckle pattern like that on the screen. That's typically what coherent light scattered from a rough surface looks like. That's the intensity pattern. More difficult to see without specialist equipment is what the phase pattern looks like. But you can see in these dark regions, there are points of perfect zero. So actually looking at a 3D pattern being swept out, it looks like this. So here we've colored these loops here, um, which are closed loops. And then these red lines are lines that just go through the edge of the volume that we measured. We don't know whether they're, they go off to infinity or whether they're closed loops. But certainly these white things are definitely closed loops. And these blobs, these pink blobs, are the bright specks. They're regions, surfaces enclosing intensities over the 50% maximum of this plot. And you can see this tangle of vortices, despite just coming just from linear wave superposition, looks rather similar to the sorts of tangles of vortices that people both uh, simulate and observe in superfluid turbulence. Of course, they're again a complex scalar functions, but there they have nonlinear dynamics rather than linear dynamics or linear non dynamics that I'm talking about. So, mathematically, if I'm talking about fully developed speckle, I can represent that as a superposition of plane waves with independent random directions and phases, very, very many of them. 
And so by the central limit theorem, my fields tend to a Gaussian random function with certain properties. I'm assuming here that the spectrum of the waves that I'm adding together is a Gaussian spectrum because that is what I would see with a typical laser beam. And the two-point function of this complex this complex random field by the wiener kinchin theorem is just again a Gaussian. So I can look at what are the statistics of this random vortex pattern. Randy on Monday mentioned the XY model. This is not really the XY model, but you can still um, compare it maybe as some high temperature limit. So you can see the vortex cores aren't uniform. They're sort of squashed, and it's relatively straightforward to calculate using Gaussian random function theory what the anisotropy um, distribution of the phase is. You can remove the phase and just keep whether it was going around clockwise or counterclockwise, and it looks like then I have a gas of opposite charges. And you can look at the two-point functions of these vortices, something originally um, considered by Bert Halperin as a sort of high temperature limit to the XY model. Um, and uh, slightly more generally by Michael Berry and myself. And you can see that it's almost uniform flat. This comes from the properties of having a Gaussian two-point function. And here, a slight repulsion of opposite, so oh, sorry, slight repulsion of same signed vortices, but um, slight attraction of oppositely signed vortices. And these are all things that can be done analytically because Gaussian statistics are very straightforward. However, I don't know how to do any statistics for topology. I don't know how, in a Gaussian random function, to look at, on average, if I hit a point, a zero point, am I on a closed loop or am I on an infinite line? If I'm on a closed loop, what's the probability distribution of the shapes of the loops? I, I would be very interested if anybody has any tools to try and answer those sorts of questions analytically. The only thing left to us was to look at it numerically. And here's an example of the sort of tangle that comes out. Again, coloring the closed loops white and the lines that don't close up red. I should say this is in a box with periodic boundary conditions, which is very long. Again, and this is the z direction. We projected out the y direction, so that it looks like there are a lot of intersections, but it's really just crossings from projection. And this long this anisotropy of our box comes from the fact that this is a realistic uh, simulation of a random optical field, where the period, it's all periodic, but the periodic, periodicity in Z is a lot longer than X and Y. So these are called Talbot cells because the periodicity in optics um, uh, is due to a phenomenon called the Talbot effect. But what we've actually got is we've superposed a, superposed a 27 by 27 Fourier grid of plane waves weighted with a Gaussian spectrum and just seen what comes out. So in these simulations where things seem to be getting stable, but of course we have a rather big anisotropy, we've got 73% of the length is in these infinite lines that don't close up, they close up in a different box, so they have a non-trivial homology topologically, versus 27% in these closed loops. Now, as the boxes get larger, it's a question whether the, well, these, whether all of, the, all of the lines become closed loops or not. So let's choose one of these lines, fix a reference point, and ask, What's the, how does the distance between two points compare with the length between two points, the arc length along the line? So length against distance, so R versus L in certain scaled, natural scaled units, I go up length by 10, R roughly doubles. Length up by 10 again, R roughly doubles again. And that's well, that turns out to be three cells high. So what have I said? I've said, of course, on a log log plot, this is a straight line. So the random interference fringes of random superpositions of lines look like some sort of fractal curve. And guess what? Add them all together. Gradient's 0.52. So they're probably Brownian fractals, which is maybe what you would expect because we don't have any we, we're beyond any other length scales, but still, this is, a, this is a question that may or may not be able to be proved rigorously. Now let's look at the closed loops. 
these guys, what's the spectrum, loop length spectrum? Again, it seems to be a straight line, log n versus log l, as a logarithmic histogram, gradients minus 2.46, which is rather similar to, well, numerical calculations um, quite a long time ago now of not a discretization of Fourier space like I'm looking, but a discretization of real space, the so-called Z3 model for phases modeling some sort of cosmic strings. And again, this scaling is saying that once you're at a certain scale, that this, this gas of loops is globally scale invariant. Now we get to the topology. Let's look at the closed loops and look at the size. Well, the radius of gyration, again, scales like 0.52. So we look like we're looking with Brownian closed, loop, Brownian closed loops. But we can look at the probability of a loop being threaded by another line. What's that probability? Well, so it could be threaded by an infinite periodic line. I could have a link, or I might have a more complicated link structure. And well, the PhD student who was doing this was so pleased when he actually worked out how to find the links, he made a movie of it. Of course, this is slightly not representative because, of course, there's a whole load of other tangled stuff around. This isn't, but of course, one of the things we're interested in is when can such structures be isolated, which I'll return to. So the probability of being unthreaded is exponentially decaying. So that's the way that you, we try to understand it. It's saying the longer the line gets, is it threaded or not? And the probability of being unthreaded decreases exponentially, where A depends on the type of threading we consider. The reason, one of the reasons for looking at this is, of course, people have looked at the knotting of random walks for a long time, people like Shura Grossberg here, and, and, and Ken Millett as, as well, of course, who have, who've, who've seen similar sort of exponential scaling, that the longer a random walk gets, the more likely it is to be knotted. But one question is how, what determines this A in units of the persistence length of these tangly curves. Now, We've, because we're simulating an entire gas of loops rather than just um, one loop at a time, we can naturally look at linking rather than just knotting, and then these different types of linking maybe um, carry some information. So here's the scaling for the hop links, the closed loops linked with each other, versus the far more likely um, closed loop being threaded by one of these infinite periodic lines, just because the infinite periodic lines are um, a lot more common. But in the simulations we did, because we couldn't get any really long loops, we couldn't get large enough to pass the A that it would take to be self-threaded, that is, to be knotted. So simulations are continuing to try and see how common, if at all, these random interference fringes in natural light are topologically knotted. I should just say, my graduate student we haven't yet, though we're still looking. And that's what my grad student is trying to do who's um, sitting here. One of the things, though, you might be saying is, why are you using this paraxial equation where you've got this very um, anisotropic box? So we're instead working with the 3D Helmholtz equation. So here's one of the tangles. The infinite periodic lines are these green. The different loops are, uh, the closed loops are all these different colors. Um, so this is 100 plane waves, and the loop fraction is 0.2. But one important thing is, that although the loop fraction is 0.2, there's a very large variance for different sorts of boxes. In some boxes, all of them are loops. And there's a very sharp crossover, as you might expect, from the very small, where, of course, because these are waves, then they're, they're all nice and smooth. And then at certain critical, then there's a certain scaling of small loops. And then at a certain critical length, um, this Brownian fractality kicks in. Um, so here are some open questions. Are the statistics of the topology the same for all the different wave equations, linear, even linear wave equations? Another question, are the statistics the same when the waves are nonlinear? So these are some open problems. But I haven't, I've said that I haven't found any knots yet after 40 minutes, so here we go. I can't see them occurring naturally. So can I engineer light beams to have knots and links in them? So that's what the final part of my talk to me. I should just summarize the previous part. There is no analytic statistics possible. It would be really great if we were able to do some sort of path integral or something to be able to work out what the 
statistical topology of these non-local um, zero lines is. But at large scales beyond correlation length scales, they appear to be Brownian random curves, as you might expect. The probability of large random loops being threaded appears similar to the, the studies emphasizing polymers for knotted random walks. And further study, we hope, will reveal connections with tangles, for example, in superfluid turbulence, which are determined by nonlinear dynamics. OK, so the creation of knotted and linked vortices in laser beams. And, well, this was a couple of years ago, Nature Physics 2010, and it was a slow news day. And I was traveling in Germany at the time, and suddenly these phone calls started coming in. And they were, I, got, I was on our local radio station, and they said, well, when all of us got up this morning, we didn't think anybody could tie light in knots. It was such a weird thing. So could you go on our show, and we'll invite our listeners to come in and ask you to react to their crazy ideas? Um, no, thanks. But, uh, you know, the, it, it captured people's imagination. It even captured the imagination of the UK Trade and Investment Services. University team revolutionizes laser technology. UK signed it, tied light in knots. And I don't quite know what new applications of laser technology they had in mind, but I, uh, they, wouldn't, um, they weren't able to answer that question. The one thing is, this was called Stock Laser Photo 4. They didn't use our picture of the knot. I prefer this blog, Diary of a Smart Chick, Science Nerds Create Cool Knots of Light. So the idea of actually looking at knotted vortices goes all the way back to Lord Kelvin, as we've heard already several times in this program. And so Kelvin was sitting in these demonstration of Peter Guthrie Tate um, showing the dynamics of smoke rings, and it crossed his mind that, well, you know, at the time in the late 1800s, nobody knew what matter was, but they were pretty sure they knew what light was. It was some wave traveling in the ether, and the ether must be some sort of perfect fluid. If it's a perfect Eulerian fluid, vortices can't cross, and so maybe this is the stability for matter we're looking at. And what he actually said, um, in his paper is that the thing is Lucretius assumes that there are all these properties of atoms that we can't know about and at least if we said that they were knotted vortices we'd be able to compute how they scatter off each other that was actually what, well in slight modern phrasing what Helmholtz that's what Kelvin was interested in but then he goes on we could describe what spectra are they're the vibration spectra of knots particle interactions vortex vortex scattering molecules could be linked knots and maybe if we only knew what the stru the classification of different knots was maybe we'd have two and then two then eight and so on and so on and the periodic table would be a topological classification of possible knots whereas of course now we know that the periodic table comes from a classification of the irreducible representations of SU2. So Kelvin wasn't able to get very far in his analysis of knotted vortices because the, the fluid dynamics analytically is so complicated. But Peter Guthrie Tate started working on classification of knots and he, well, it's often said he founded modern knot theory not because he was the first, because Gauss did it, but because Tate was a physicist, he posed lots of questions and then that propelled knot theory forward trying to answer Tate's conjectures. But we're talking about knotted fields, not knotted structures. So here are some examples of knotted fields. So Aref and Zawadzki are seeing these. Well, this was a, a numerical solution of linked vortex rings in a fluid flow. Um, Peter Sutcliffe. Sorry, Paul Sutcliffe is here, um, in, and he, he's studied topological sol solitons in quantum field theory, so nonlinear skirm theories that support certain um, um, knot topologies such as this. Um, these are so the organizing centers um, in excitable media in chemical reactions or biological reactions might have some, some topological knotting, which was studied by Art Winfrey. And um, just this morning in the program, we heard William Irvine talked about knotted configurations of time-dependent electromagnetic fields, solutions of Maxwell's equations. And well, Randy was saying on Monday that the reason, one of the reasons for why not now is because we're able to do the engineering that we couldn't do before. We could also say that why not now we can really have some nice pictures. So I got interested in this problem as a PA graduate student, um, and one of the th questions that I wanted, well, I, I was sort of investigating, is whether you could um, 
create knotted vortices out of a superposition of waves based on some sort of solution of superposition of waves which follow the Hopf or Seifert vibration. So what I'm thinking of is I'm thinking of a superposition of waves that are maybe waves in cylindrical coordinates where I have an e to the i l phi up the z-axis, which would be a vortex like this, and then I superpose them together in such a way that I can get a zero ring in, say, the z equals zero plane, again with a certain phase variation across. And with a little bit of, 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 of help from computers, it's not difficult to find such solutions from superpositions of cylindrical beams. And so, having got a hot for Seifert vibration, I can just kick it with a plane wave, and these high order things break apart. If this is rotating around here, when it breaks apart, it'll be a helix whose ends are joined. That is to say, I'll have a knotted, well, this is an example of a trefoil knot threaded through by this stuff up the middle. And, well, I did this with my PhD supervisor, Michael Berry, and he was so impressed with it, he went off and did the calculation of knotted or linked nodes of energy eigenstates in hydrogen using exactly the same sort of idea. So these would be, so these are sort of vortex lines, Dirac, knotted Dirac strings in hydrogen. Of course, there are no monopoles here. But that's a bit low tech because all it required was a little bit of, of, of superposition of waves and well we've got this sort of threading structures and we don't really it's a sort of we don't know how special it is or it's not very stable if I kick it too strongly these things will reconnect away and so going back to it and trying to understand it more requires me to understand what knot theory is a little bit more and of course the main aim of knot theory is to classify mathematically all knots and when I say knots I also mean links and it's simplest to count knots and links according to their minimum crossing number. If I, if I move these projection around, I might be able to get rid of some crossings, but there'll always be a minimum number of crossings. And this is the simplest possible knot, the trefoil knot. And of course, this was the same question that Peter Guthrie Tate asked, and he, his, his way of classifying knots was to try and write his periodic table of the knots, and this is what it looks like, as he called it, the first seven orders of knottiness. What he means is he's going up, the simplest is three crossings and there's four crossings all the way up to an attempt to classify up to ten crossing knots. So this one, here it is up there, that's the only three crossing knot, here's the only four crossing knot, two five crossing knots. So, so far it looked a bit like the periodic table, but then the six crossing knots, there's three rather than eight of them. So rather than looking at the full table, let's look at a little more detail at the very simplest knots and links. So of course, as Randy said on Monday, the, we call this a knot just like we call zero a number. There's no number when it's zero, and there's no knot when it's the unknot. The simple link, hop link I've already talked about, that's just two rings linked together. Trefoil knot is got three crossings. That's the only three crossing knot. The only four crossing knot is this so-called figure eight knot. There's also a four crossing link, maybe called the four twist link, then the single foil knot with five crossings, and there's also the three twist knot, which Randy talked about on Monday, which also has five crossings. And you can already see, even with this very early um, set of knots on the knot classification, certain patterns arising. This has a two fold, three fold, four fold, five fold symmetry. And these symmetries are related to the fact that these guys are all torus knots. Torus knots that wrap around, well, one, one integer this way and another integer this way. The unknot can wrap, so long as it wraps around once this way, it can wrap any number of times the other way and it will still be unknotted. Well, sort of two and two is the hop link. This common divisor of two indicates there are two components. Three, two is the trefoil knot. 4, 2 is this link, and again, 2, the common divisor. 5, 2 is the synchrofoil. But these two knots can't be drawn on the surface of a torus. So we're already seeing some of that complexity coming in. And my question that I really wanted to try and tackle was, can I find, originally, can I find in the mathematics literature some way of creating a figure 8 knot that I can embed in a solution of the paraxial wave equation? Now, again, Randy talked about this on Monday, that these, the, 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 because we're in a knotted field, we can't just create any knot that we want. We can only create knots that the complex 
phase structure around everything will support. And so, because I'm interested in complex numbers, the knots I'm interested in are, in are fibred knots. Knots that, well, that, that, that the, the knots that you can draw are zero lines and complex scalar fields which are unthreaded by anything else. And topologically, the reason why this is non-trivial is the phase surfaces, the surfaces of constant argument, must fill all of space because every point not on the knot has a complex number. It's all continuous. They can only intersect on the knot. And not all knots have that property. So it's not quite right, of course, say the trefoil 5 by 2 whole tori, but because I'm a physicist, I can get away with such imprecise statements if Ken will let me. So one theorem is that the torus knots are all fibred, so I ought to be able to get these. The figure 8 knot is fibred, but the three twist knot is not fibred. So there's no way I would expect to be able to make this in an isolated way. OK, so I can still try and see if I can get my figure 8 knot out. And the literature that uh, my student and I were drawn to was this, well, this book, Singularities of Complex Hypersurfaces, by John Milner in the 1960s, who was looking at the connection between knot theory and singularity theory. If I have a high order singularity in, say, four dimensional space, R4, I could put a copy of the three sphere around it, and then the, there's a classification that those singularities, um, around, uh, uh, if you look at this three sphere, could look like knots in the, th fibered knots in the, th well, Okay, some form of algebraic knot in the three sphere. And emphasis was uh, placed on polynomials in two complex variables, so it's a singularity in, say, u and v, and then what knots are possible that way. But that led to a literature, first with Perron and then Lee Rudolph in the 1980s, which sort of led us to think of trying to cre create our fibred knots by finding not fibred, starting with fibred knots, but fibred braids. And so what we're explicitly, we want to find an explicit construction of a fibred knot, and we do that by constructing a complex polynomial with a variable u, complex variable u, which has n roots, which correspond to the strands of my braid, and these are parameterized by a real variable h. So by the fundamental theorem of algebra, p sub h of u is just factored u minus the positions of the roots. So for example, I could have a pigtail braid, just like if you were going to braid hair. What you have is three strands that are all following this infinity symbol, this lemniscate shape. And so that means that these uj's, these roots, are it turns some sort of Lissajou figure, in this case, this combination of cosine and sine of this real parameter h, which is time in this movie. But when I'm thinking about the braid, it's not going to be time, it's going to be the height along the braid. And then the idea is, with this function of this braid, I can take advantage of, well, what I know as, as, of as Alexander's theorem, which could be paraphrased and not is a panoramic view of a braid. So this is our favorite, famous panoramic view in Bristol, the Clifton Suspension Bridge, and here happens to be a braid around it. So as we look around the panorama, you can see that I've got these, these strands twisting around horizontally. And, well, while I went and found that braid, my student took a picture of me. So you can see that as I remove it, that braid with the ends joined here has become the, well, this is the trefoil knot, which is um, a set of, well, a double helix that's crossing three times. So I'm going to follow Randy's lead and see if I can do it experimentally. So you see I've got a, a braid, uh, well, an unbraid, and if I put three twists in it, two, three or three half twists and join the ends so yellow meets blue and blue meets yellow because just as in the picture here I can't because I want to get a single component out and I pull it apart you can see that I get the trefoil knot. So knots and braids are very closely related and it's far easier if I'm thinking about explicit constructions to try and construct braids. So here's the example I've just talked about, the double helix braid, where my roots correspond to exponentials in the complex plane. So there they are rotating around. I've got two roots, j is 0 and 1. h increases up here. 
But then, well, what the Milner trick of trying to think of these complex numbers in a way translates to is replacing e to the ih on n, where n is the number of strands, and m is the number of repeats I do before I close it up, goes to v to the m. So my polynomial that I had before, in terms I can multiply out, I've got all these e to the ih, ih blah in my coefficients of u, becomes a polynomial in u and v. So this is the Milnor construction. And then, mathematically, I can replace u and v with these functions of x, y, and z, where r, is, r squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And then this gives me a function in x, y, z space, which has that knot with the ends joined. So effectively, the v, the phase, the argument of v, has become the azimuthal angle variable in cylindrical coordinates, and the ends are joined smoothly. So that's the way this Milnor construction works. And, well, it was raised this morning by Rob Kuzner that the, the, asking this classification in the early uh, 80s, late 70s, what sorts of knots arise as singularities of, of complex analytic polynomials in U and V, and there's certain iterated cables of torus knots. All of the twisting, all of the, all of the crossings have to have the same sign. But the figure eight knot, they don't all have, we, doesn't have a braid representation like that, so that sounds bad. But this stuff from the, that we looked at from Perron and Rudolph gave the hint that maybe what we should look at is then braids like this that have cosine and sine in the representation. Of course, when I multiply this thing out, it's not just in terms of e to the ih, it's got a combination of e to the ih and e to the minus ih. So I get v and v conjugate, so my two-variable polynomial is no longer analytic in V. And this pigtail braid gives, with the two repeats, ends up giving a polynomial like this. I join the ends of this AB inverse AB inverse braid in the same way as I did before. I get the figure eight knot. So this is an explicit construction of a complex scalar function that's analytic in one variable but not the other variable that gives me a fibred knot that's not an iterated uh, torus knot. So I can try to classify what knots I could make from iterating this simple construction by varying the number of strands, varying the number of repeats, and if I'm going to think about these limniscates, varying what my student maybe confusingly called the number of loops, that is to say the number of times I go up and down before I close up. So in that sense, torus knots all follow, they're a set of n strands with m repeats, those are my two numbers, but they're all running around a circle. If I look instead at the knots whose braids are uh, made by running around this length, this gate, there's the figure eight knot. I've got two, three strands and two repeats, but if I had three repeats, I'd get Borromean rings. Four repeats, I'd have the knot called 818. Five repeats, I'd have the knot called 10, 1, 2, 3, and so on. You can see here's twofold, threefold, fourfold, and fivefold symmetry. But I could also increase the number of strands. And here get 6, 3, 8, 9, 10, 17, and so on. I know what these knots are, it's just that they don't have any simple representation uh, that was sort of written in the knot theory books. They're sort of, they're lot, sort of look very complicated and tangled. I could then increase this number of loops from 2 to 3. So four strands going around this pattern is the link L6A1, 7, 7, 9, 31, 9, and again the same, and it can keep on going. Of course, I could do all sorts of things. This is just the beginnings of trying to think of knots classified in this way. And thinking about knots coming from braid representations leads to some very surprising patterns, patterns in the coefficients of the Jones, coefic Jones polynomial coefficients, patterns in the Conway notation that to some extent has been considered by um, Slavik Yablan and Radmila Sazdanovic, who's also uh, participating in this workshop. So again, so far this is mathematics, I haven't said what's physics and the PDEs about it. And this is a bit that I'm a little bit stuck on, maybe somebody can help me. This is the engineering. Engineering, you try something and you twiddle with the knobs a bit and then it works and then it's fine, but you still don't necessarily understand it. So we've got a complex polynomial in X, Y, Z with a knotted nodal line, some sort of algebraic variety. 
Now in the z equals zero symmetry plane, cutting this bagel in half, I get a polynomial in only x and y because I set z to be zero, and I get this particular, these, these places are the places where the knot cu cuts the, um, that plane. Then, because it's linear, I can just propagate this pattern according to the Schrodinger equation. And I get the same knot. Very mysterious. I don't understand why. Well, I've got some guesses, but again, uh, if someone liked to help me, that would be great. So, but what this now is, this is a wave function. This is a solution, a partial differential equation with a knotted nodal line in. So, just to say, what you do is you make the braid. You join the ends of the braid by folding through the three sphere, and then take that slice, propagate, hope for the best. And what can I say? There's enough knobs that we can twiddle with in this construction that even if this doesn't give us the right knot with the first braid we try, we can change the geometric parameters and it gives us the right knot. So here's an example of a wave function with Borromean rings. It's this double lemnis gate, three strands and three repeats. Here's a more complicated example, five strands, triple lemnis gate and two repeats, which would give us this braid, one, three, inverse, two, inverse, four squared, eight crossings, but it simplifies in the minimum crossing to give seven crossings. <laughs> There's the Milner polynomial. It gives us that rather symmetric object that in a minimum crossing representation is the knot known as 7-7. Seven, seven. Now, so that's, okay, so I've, what have I done? I've propagated a polynomial. I'm filling a polynomial with all space. That's a bit naughty. That's certainly not physical because polynomials diverge at infinity. However, because I'm thinking about light, what I can do is I could just modulate that initial plane with a Gaussian profile in the intensity. And that both regularizes the amount of energy I'm talking about and turns my solution into exactly the sort of thing I can program into a spatial light modulator. The sort of hologram, computer controlled hologram, that people use um, to sculpt light beams um, in labs around the world. So, the one degree of freedom I've got is the width of this Gaussian. So, let's make it very, very large so it looks flat close to where the action is for the knot. So, the phase pattern isn't changed because this is just a real function. And if this width is infinity, or the limit of it being infinity, I get just the case that I was talking about before. And this example is for the hot fling. If I bring it down from infinitely large to 2, so here's the edge of that Gaussian modulation, it's stretched these zero lines a bit, but I still have the topology of a hot fling. But if I bring it down from 2 to 1.58, doesn't look like much of a change, it's completely changed the knot topology, a link topology. And what's happened is there are extra nodal lines that come in from infinity as I bring W naught down and they reconnect and wash the knot away because this isn't fundamentally topologically stable. I only have a range of parameters where this topology exists. But what I can do now is I can realize these knots as sums of superpositions of these Laguerre Gaussian modes I was talking about. So here's the spectrum, the coefficients for the trefoil knot the coefficients for the synchrofoil knot and the coefficients for the figure eight knot. Now, when you're thinking about engineering, of course, there's a question of tolerances and these aren't necessarily very stable. Nevertheless, for something as simple as the hot link, it was good enough to see the experiment. So we're scanning through the laser beam here using a CCD on a motorized stage. So what we're doing is embedding the desired intensity and phase pattern on this hologram here, controlled by a computer, and then that creates the knot or link down here, and then the, the 3D structure can be reconstructed from a series of measurements of different planes. So you can see here are the zeros. They go through this dance, and they, they, they vanish away because we've passed through the range that the knot is, and join the dots. And here's the hop link, experimental hop link. That's a simple one. Makes something more complicated, so we think of dialing it up, and well, okay, dialing up's a bit slow, um, but I get something that looks like it's got the right fivefold topology, but actually, you look at it more closely, it's not the synchrofoil, it's actually 
uh, link, it's this four twist link. So what we had to do, which is part of the story of engineering, is use the sort of holographic search algorithms people use to, to make very fast control of light beams, say, and optical tweezers, but not to try and optimize the bright parts of the beam, but to optimize the dark parts of the beam, to try and get them as flat as possible in order to try and get these patterns, to maximize the simplicity of the geometry of the curve and flat intensity off the knot. And with that, Optimization turns out it's not much of a change to the spectrum, but there is the experimental trefoil knot. Here's the phase pattern, the dance of the vortex lines in 2D that gives rise to this 3D geometric pattern. Synchrofoil knot, that's what it looks like, but unfortunately um, the tolerances aren't good enough to have got an experimental figure eight knot yet. So that challenge to find an experimental figure eight knot is still out there. So that's, well, that's our experimental picture. You can see it's experimental because there are some Newton rings there. Once we've got these engineering, we can start using them as tools. So one thing is we can see whether we can entangle photons in these tangled states. So we're looking at entangled tangles and use the geometry of a knot as a way of correlating between the different photons. And OK, so you look at the sort of what we call the quantum contrast between two different geometric variables, and they do agree with what we'd expect to see, um, an entanglement between two different photons, both with this knot structure. So just to summarize then, so what I've done is I've shown a scheme of actually constructing explicit Milnor maps for different sorts of knots via braids. Which And then what I did with those Milnor maps, I sliced the bagel and propagated according to the Schrodinger equation. And for some reason, I get a solution to the paraxial wave equation, which has the same knot as the Milnor polynomial. I haven't talked about it, but you, I don't just have to work with a 2 plus 1 Schrodinger equation. I can work with other linear and nonlinear equations, and this construction does seem to work, um, at least in our preliminary investigations. And by multiplying this maybe unphysical polynomial solution by a Gaussian, we were able to generate experimentally realizable knotted beams. So here are some references, and I can show you them later if you're interested. And I'll leave you to read um, an anticipation of our workshop by James Clark Maxwell. Thank you very much. That's an open question. Well, unless somebody can... Do Milnor maps, this sort of construction, give all possible fiber knots? Well, and of course, these Milnor maps, meaning these sorts of things that are, well, uh, complex analytic in one variable, but not the other one. Excuse me, about this speckled pattern. Doesn't seem to be on. Give me this one. Okay, about speckled patterns. Uh, if you compare lens of this, <coughs> look at thing that you see, the FEC, and check what is the pro expected probability to observe nodes. What, what does come up? Does this procedure avoid nodes or the loops you see are just too short? I think the news, loops we see are just too short. I mean, they're, they're, they're orders of magnitude, well, it seem to be about an order of magnitude shorter than the sorts of things you normally look at. There's, I mean, and I guess looking at these tangles, the sort of naive looking at them, they say, well, it could be knotted or it might not be knotted, but of course, the length has to be really long enough to, to get knots. So, that, so that's a very good question, and, that's, and that comes to one of the, certainly with this sort of question about this, this paraxial versus Milnor, that one of the things that's, that, that does seem to be real, um, necessary is that if you think of having a braid that's got all of these sort of different crossings, if I slice through the braid, if I was going to draw it here where the, the slice is the plane where all the, of all the crossings, 
then nothing really happens other than a bunch of bridges in the, as I propagate upwards. Now, if I was to slice the braid instead in that plane, then there are a whole bunch of extra crossings that goes on above there. And this construction doesn't seem to capture all of them. It only catches, sort of launches these things up so they meet in quite the right ways. So that's not quite an answer to your question, but that shows that that's certainly a requirement. If you sort of defocus, as you might think, then yeah, it does. It, the Milnor construction requires you to really be thinking of this as a symmetry plane. No. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. So uh, uh, we haven't looked at it. Well, you can maybe answer that by the end of the workshop. Right, so one of the reasons mathematically for using the paraxial wave equation is that it has a minimal number of parameters. In a way, when we're thinking of, um, thinking of light beams but moving beyond the paraxial wave equation, you introduce an extra parameter which is sort of asymptotically factored out by the paraxial equation. And so, so long as that extra parameter isn't too far from paraxial, just like with the Gaussian width, the Gaussian width is sufficiently wide, then these knots are fine. They get deformed, but they don't change the topology. You make, in the cases that we've looked at, you make that parameter too small, the focusing is too tight, then yes, it does give us a different structure from these knot structures. But again, there are so many free parameters here, you can fiddle with them. Um, maybe it's possible to keep, keep the knot structure, however tightly focusing, however tightly focus, you focus the light, but we haven't looked at that. So we haven't looked at that. I don't know whether there are there are um, what would be the most natural way to start looking at something like that with, say, the 3D liquid crystal you're thinking of. One of the things we have thought about is a, not with a sort of liquid crystal three dimensions and interac interaction, but with a quantum condensate in an interaction. Because of course, if you've got a Bose-Einstein condensate and you tune it the right way, the phase of the quantum wave is going to be matched to the phase of the light field that you put on it. So with the right sort of um, light pattern, you could imprint a vortex knot inside a BEC, which of course, that would be, well, which is one of the purposes of this engineering way of initial state creation. And then you could study experimentally the nonlinear dynamics dynamics of a knot in a BEC, just like William this morning was talking about engineering um, a vortex knot in a classical fluid. Um, you have a technical problem then, uh, just as William talked about in the fluids, that somehow if I'm going to pass this 3D knot through my 3D um, condensate in such a way that a certain that I capture that right spatial information rather than just sort of sweeping a knot structure through the three dimensions, that's a challenge. And well, as I say, we heard from William this morning how he got round it for, um, for fluid mechanics. It seems rather different if we're trying to effectively imprint phase patterns into matter waves. But that's a, that's a, that's a, a strong application, potentially, of this, of this um, engineering. Okay, well, let's thank Mark again. Thank you.